of what's happening in our communities and what these recent incidents tell us about the very evident pressure many still carry from what was an extraordinarily difficult year. Well, joining me in studio now are Dr. Oscar Gidua, a consulting forensic psychologist, and Pete Oko, the founder of Crime C. Poor. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Let me begin with you, Dr. Gidua. In terms of when you look at these reports, and I, I just did almost an amateur poll of some of the media reports in the first two weeks of January, and I was shocked to find that in the first 14 days, there were at least 12 murders reported. So I know a lot of focus had been put on the Warunge family murders, um, but a lot more is happening outside of that. And, and when you kind of zoom out to look at the bigger picture, you know, from, from your assessment, as you see what's been going on in our society based on 2020, uh, what's what's going on? Are things coming to a head now uh, in terms of uh, 2020 and how tough it was? Um, thank you so much, Vicky, for having me. Um, what, what I want to say is that um, it's pretty unfortunate that um, the, the statistics that you're giving, I wouldn't even call them amateur at all. I think they're a true reflection of what's been happening in the society. But I think one of the things I'd like to mention, uh, probably for your viewers to be clear about, is that 2020 was a very unprecedented year. A lot of stresses, a lot of stressors, and probably what we're seeing now, I'll, I'll use a colloquial um, reference and probably say that these are the children of 2020. Um, what we're seeing now, the stress levels coming to our head, um, things that are happening within the families, the violence we're seeing, as well as even murders or killings, uh, because of course for us to call it murder, it has to be a legally uh, defined concept. However, I think the stress that has been there polling from the 2020 season and from before is now coming to a head and that's what we're seeing right now. Right, Pete, let me bring you in. Uh, you've come in with your reflector jacket, I assume, because you were actually out in the field today. Um, I know you work a lot in the community, talking to the youth. You have a pulse on what's happening, you know, what's troubling them. What have you observed um, in the last year, and, and then what we're seeing in terms of the violent crimes in the beginning of the year, 2021? Uh, thanks for having me, Vicky. I think the key thing is what uh, Dr. Oscar's already mentioned, maybe the stress levels and stuff. Okay. But in some of the communities we are working in, we find that the violent crimes are actually instigated. There are people behind those crimes. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the family kind of uh, crimes, but just in general, are we having politicians instigating uh, violent crime? You go to Nakuru, which has been a hotbed of crime of late. The, none other than uh, the assistant district commissioner said they knew that politicians were involved in that. And as we go into the electioneering period and um, and the political heightened political season, we know that there's likelihood of crime going up. But what I'd like to tell guys is that if we keep our youth engaged, in communities where the youth are getting fully engaged right now, most of them are volunteering. They don't have like steady jobs, but it's a mindset thing that if they're getting fully engaged within their communities, they have something uh, to look forward to, the crime figures are going down. And I just have to be very um, deliberate here and say in areas where we've worked in or where we're working in, and we are working in co collaboration with the law enforcement as Crime Sipoa, they've come down, we have community dialogues, the, the youth and the people in the community bring out what's really you know, pulling them down, and uh, we are having solutions done at the local level. So the bottom-up approach is working even in areas where we had high police extrajudicial killings. This is not to say that it's totally uh, obliterated, but the key thing is that the more we engage the youth, the more we get them to do the right thing, the less they spend time listening to people who didn't get them to do this kind of uh, uh, negative you know, societal issues that uh, put them in uh, at loggerheads with law enforcement. Right, and, and let me bring you in, Dr. Gidu, on that, because how can you then tell the difference between, or rather decipher what is a criminal mind, right? So someone who um, acts violently and commits a crime, yeah. or someone who's kind of uh, prone to violence, they're not necessarily someone who is premeditating something, mm -hmm. but they reacted in the moment. So how can you tell the difference? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I, I think I'd like to uh, inform the viewers that probably it's not going to be amateur assessments. However, there are ways you can actually tell the difference between career criminals as well as people who are predisposed to violent crime as opposed to those who we have seen probably who commit crimes of passion. And when I say crimes of passion, 
they are crimes that were not necessarily premeditated, but they came up as a result of a heated argument or a disagreement between people who know each other and previously before the crime cared really a lot about each other and probably something happened. So now that we have those ones out of the way, uh, in order to be able to know a, a violent criminal, there are many things you have to look at. I think uh, what, uh, what Peter's mentioned is very key, uh, young people especially. You, you look at uh, a few factors, of course, I know we'll get deeper into this later. However, many of them will come from uh, homes that are broken. And when I say broken, I don't mean a single mother or single father. That's really a misconception. I mean a family that does not have enough supervision. Uh, for the young people. So that, that means that the children don't have the attention they require. Uh, they have issues with school and they probably have delinquency issues there and truancy. You're going to see that with, with someone who's in that trajectory. They also come from a community that probably um, agrees with them being in crime and actually uh, houses other people who are criminals. And um, la uh, second to last, they come from, uh, from uh, an individual perspective that's not really very well resilient and it's not really uh, guarded against crime. So for example, kids who do not even understand what their purpose is, who do not have a purpose, that's a big one. But then the last and most powerful one, especially for young people, is the peers and the kind of peers that a young person has. If a young person hangs around with people who are also delinquent, it is possible that they could also end up in crime. So those are some of the ways of knowing uh, at, 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 at a lower level uh, who might be a criminal as opposed to who commits a one-off violent crime. Right. Uh, Pete, you know, when you're dealing with a lot of these youth um, through your program, Crime Sipoa, um, how much of a factor is drugs, alcohol, or other addictive substances, you know, in terms of being accelerants to pushing many of these youth into criminal activity? I'll say drugs play a major role, but we, we have to demystify the drugs as they've been known, because many times people call weed the main drug that drives youth to crime. Um, we know there's a proliferation of uh, weed everywhere, and even the consumers are all different. I mean, we've had governors confessing they use weed, we've had MPs confessing they use weed, and no action has been taken against them. So that, that, that basically makes the youth believe that it's normal. It's a recreational drug as we speak today. But we have other drugs, designer drugs. We have Molly, we have those high-end drugs that cost maybe 2,000 bob per, per tablet. Who brings these drugs? Your drug dealer today is not that guy at the corner of the street in dreads who sells weed. Your drug dealer today drives a VX. He parks where kids are, he comes to the clubs where they go to, and your kids are being led into that by people who are able to have better judgment. So the, the kind of drugs these kids are using now actually makes them be addicted more to the drugs and it's very hard for them to come out. The issues Dr. Oscar is raising are pertinent. Many times we've blamed single families. I was in prison, I know the kind of, when we started Crime Zipper, we started on death row of committee. And it was because 75% of the guys were coming to prison were young people. The numbers haven't changed. The biggest number of crime being committed in this country right now is sexual and gender-based violence. The biggest number going to prison right now, maybe 60% or more, is also sexual and gender-based violence. So the violence that we are having in the homestead goes out to the streets eventually. Mm. If we're talking about dysfunctional families, you'll find in prison, Dr. Oscar could have just given his analysis, but I'll tell you again from prison, the biggest number, again, are from dysfunctional families, not single parent families. We have to stop this habit of blaming single parents or single mom, so your kids will be pro problematic, single dads. Let's do our societal bit. We, we're just abdicating our roles. Where are the dads? By the way, the biggest challenge is the dads. Go to any school where we go to today, Parents' Day is called, it's only the mothers were there. You go to prison where the young people are there, only the mothers come there. What's happening to the dads? Where are we? We are failing this society and we are the first to throw the stones and lay blame on the feet of very innocent people. These kids just need your company. They need, they need your presence in their lives. I'm dealing with a kid from a very high-end high, high family mm. who told me his only problem that was making him cause problem was because the dad was not there for him. There's no one to talk to him. He wants someone to talk to. He's there with the mom. The mom is saying, my son, he's been okay, but he's been having problems, challenges. You go down, what's happening? The dad is absent. I go to another private school to talk to kids. They have gangs in that school. It's a private, top-end private school. And the gangs are fighting or they're disagreeing because of the brands of cars their dads drive. 
So it's not about driving a Prado. It's, are you, is your dad driving a VX or is he driving just the ordinary Prado? Unbelievable that it can be that trivial. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it yeah. comes down to car brands. But let me bring in Dr. Gidu on that because you mentioned something really important. When it comes to majority of the cases, at least in the prisons, it's young people. Mm -hmm. It's something that's related to domestic violence or something related to the homes. You know, Dr. Gidu, this is pointing to family issues, True. a breakdown of family structures. And even when you look at a lot of the violent crimes, at least from what I saw in the last two weeks, it was involving people that were known to the victims. Mm. Right. Uh, so what does that say about where our society is and, and the role of family? Well, I mean, I mean what, what, what you're raising is really key. And I think what Pete also raised is, is important. Um, your observations are right. Uh, first of all, uh, when you tell me that the people who are involved in the scuffles and the crimes are people who are known to each other, I'll guess that the victims of the crime is a female. That's because studies have shown that more crime is meted out to women by people who are known to them than men. Uh, for men, it's usually mostly strangers and not people who, who are known to them. And when that happens, it's, it's basically the issues of proximity, of temperatures rising in the home, uh, stress, unemployment, people arguing over petty things. As a matter of fact, one of the things that happened in the first quarter of last year in 2020 in Kenya through the data that we have was that domestic violence numbers rose threefold just in the first quarter. That already was even before we were in the thick of the pandemic. So you can imagine that with more people losing jobs, with more families uh, losing their bigger homes and going to smaller spaces, the, the effect of proximity was really actually uh, uh, exacerbating some of these things that we're seeing. So for me, I think that what you're saying is true, and, I, uh, and, and, and young people, dysfunctional families, people who are not resilient as of now, and let me touch on briefly about the drug issue that Pete uh, uh, answered. Um, it's important for our viewers to know that when a person ingests drugs, it's almost like they're not themselves again. So intoxication will really affect them behaviorally, and also in terms of a neurochemical balance. And one of the worst things about it is that once they take the drugs, they do not have control over their, their, their actions sometimes in terms of knowing who they, they're talking to or who they're addressing. So you find kids beating up their parents and talking badly to them. Culturally, that's not really acceptable even to us growing up. I, I wouldn't even imagine speaking up to an adult and, and speaking like that. But because of the effect of taking the drugs, that is going to happen. And in that course of the altercation, it's very easy for someone to commit what I was calling a crime of passion, probably not really premeditated. Right. And just to kind of keep on that note in terms of someone not thinking correctly or thinking straight when they're under the influence, because a lot of questions came up, especially when uh, the story of the Warunge killings came up, of course, still alleged. Yes. But uh, people wondering how can that happen that, you know, you can uh, stab a loved one several times, mm -hmm. you know, for it to degenerate to that point. Mm -hmm. What is going on in, in one's mind? Well, I mean, I don't want to speculate about that specific case, and of course it would not be professional for me to do so. However, what I would say is that many times when we see uh, crimes involving stabbings and multiple uh, stabs, uh, of course it's family members, but then from a mental health perspective, there are things uh, that could actually be affecting somebody, things like paranoia or even psychosis, which might actually come in and someone might not even be attacking who they think they're attacking. Uh, when somebody is delusional as well, they could actually have a paranoid delusion and imagine that you're going to attack them or that you hate them or that you are unfair to them. So before you do something to them, they'll act on their delusion. Um, the other thing, let's not forget also the number of of, of, of cases that we've had of people who have died through suicide. Uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's also another uh, uh, piece of evidence to us that mental health issues are really key. And I, and I think, uh, Victoria, you more than anybody else and your viewers would know that last year uh, I was part of the Mental Health Task Force, which submitted our, the report to the Minister of Health uh, on July 7th last year. And in that report, we actually articulated the issues that are affecting Kenyans uh, deeply in, from a mental health perspective. We had a, pre uh, a postscript section which talked about the pandemic and things that have to be put in place for us to make sure that we don't degenerate uh, in, into, into worse uh, conditions. Absolutely. Uh, Pete, let me bring you in, because when you look at what happened last year, schools were shut down for nine months. And 
you know, I started to think what the residual effect of that will be. Schools are reopened. Yes, we appear to be back to normal. But we have to think about this. This is the first time globally that a generation has gone through something like this. Um, I read in an article that this is the biggest psychological experiment ever yes. when you think about what we had to go through. But for the young ones who are not able to really decipher and process uh, what this means, we already saw a bit of this uh, with the teenage pregnancies last year. Now, some young women are already mothers or are going to be giving birth this year, and, and you can already imagine what that means in terms of the burden it will be for the communities that they live in. Um, so what is your assessment of just the effect of that nine month shutdown on our young minds moving forward? You know, the, the, the nine month shutdown was, it was, it was, it was sudden as it was uh, uh, surprising to many people. They didn't know how to handle that. And young people found they had so much time and space in their hands. From Crime City Power, what happened is we've never rested. I think Citizen covered the first story we were doing down uh, in Kibra with Shofko, who's our partner. And, and we decided from the word go that other than the other than the COVID-related intervention, what are we going to do to keep these kids busy? I mean, our partners and us at Crime City Power, we've been busy keeping young kids, you know, very busy. The ones in prison, because we could go to prison, we, we were allowed by the prison's authorities, and we have to thank them for this, that we could have virtual counseling sessions with them. And some have just been released recently, as, late, as recently as this week, and they're going back to school. The girls we've worked with through this season, and I want to thank the young volunteers. Most of our work is done by volunteers. University students, some are graduates without work. They're just coming and volunteering to serve the community. They're pouring into the community. I have to say Crime Sipo has seen its biggest growth because of young people going out deliberately to support their fellow young people and the community owning the process of supporting each other and growing together. To answer your question now, none of the girls that I know of that we handle got pregnant because our, co our, 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 our program talks deliberately about all these issues. We have young girls of their age, we have teachers, we have psychologists who talk to them about these things. Many parents don't want to talk to their, par to their kids about these real life issues and that's why uh, we are finding such, such things happening. It's come a time when parents have to take their role as well and speak about it because kids don't know how to handle that when it happens. Uh, having said that, we have to look at the bigger picture of the society. What, does, what role does the society play? We can't be talking about 50,000 or 10,000, even 5,000 pregnant children, and we haven't seen 10,000 men being charged with defiling those children. Because having sex with a child is a crime. Mm. So where are we failing? If we know the fathers, we should be taking them and guiding them to the prisons where they can learn that it's not right to defile young children. So the key thing is, where are we quiet? Is it because some of these people are related to us? Is it because some of these people are so powerful we don't want to face them? Is it because we just want to normalize defilement and rape in this country? We have to face it. We have to face it that as a society we've failed. Men, we've failed. We've just failed. There's no shortcut about it. And this country needs to reawaken. We are not going to talk statistics every day about human life that is being lost when we can mitigate those issues. Those are issues we see on a daily basis. Right. When people go somewhere and start inciting you to violence, just walk off. Just walk off. You don't have to do what they're telling you. In Nakuru, the young people told me one thing, and they're here listening and watching. They were being promised 500 to go cause chaos, political chaos. And after causing that chaos, they are arrested, and even those politicians don't pay them the 500. We had a young people, we had two young people in committee who had been told by someone to go kill someone, a rival. And after killing that person, they ended up in committee. They were not paid the 10,000 they had been promised, and they were rotting there and complaining and crying. So young people, my message to you today is don't be used by anyone. As the president told you the other day, it's your time to lead. And you're not going to lead through drugs. Right. You're not going to lead through violence. You're, not, you're going to lead through example. And so take the, the leadership yeah. at all levels, first morally, discipline-wise, and take the leadership. We are here to support you. I'm here to support you. It's the unfortunate reality of youth being used as pawns. Uh, but let me finish with you, Dr. Gidua, in terms of what can be done. Let's look at the solutions sure. to ensure that we reach people who are probably prone to violence before it's too late. Mm. And, and just tips you can give to those watching on how to relieve the stress, especially if they're still carrying it from the year before. Mm. People have not unpacked what happened in 2020. Um, so how would you kind of advise them to navigate this year? 
Well, that, that's a really heavy question, Vicky, because I think that we have to take a multi-pronged approach to do that. Uh, first of all, we have to acknowledge that last year was not the year that everybody wanted it to be, and that we actually are hurt for many reasons. Some people have lost jobs, others have, have lost family members through the disease, through COVID, and, and through other means. People have, there's a lot of loss in the air, basically. So the first thing that I would ask people to do is to genuinely care for each other, starting from the family level. You don't know what that person who's walking through the door has gone through outside. True. Just really talking to them and finding out how their day was genuinely. And also sometimes suspending what you think is important to you and listening to someone else might actually be a good way for you to actually uh, get some help yourself. That's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, at a micro level, um, you know, at, a, at an individual level, we are our own experts. We are the ones who know how we are. And the one thing that I've asked people to do over and over again is to get an accountability partner. So for example, today I've met uh, Pete and we've become friends. So I say that maybe he can actually be the one who tells me if I'm going off, he'll be like, hey, Dr. Oscar, what's going, what's going on with you? You're not as jovial as you normally are. And this is really important because sometimes when people are changing, Vicky, they don't even know that they're changing. And so you need someone else who can actually be able to point out, call out when that is happening. And we're going to avert a lot of things. And most importantly, this country has really built a lot of capacity for mental health issues. So going to the primary health care facility, you're going to find a counselor or a psychologist you can speak to, but mostly your family members is where you have to begin. So those are a few of the tips. I'm sure we can spend more time and at another time really go deeper, but I want to ask people, let us start becoming empathetic to each other's causes and each other's situations. We don't know what someone is going through. And that's really going to help us as a country to mend the, the, the heart that we already have and to actually go forward better because we don't know. There's COVID-19. We don't know if there's going to be COVID-20 or 21. And that's what we have to really remember. I think that's what 2020 has taught us. We sure hope that there's no COVID-2020 20, 20 or 2021. 20, but thank you so much, Pete and Dr. Gidua, for your insights. Uh, hopefully it starts conversations, very necessary conversations, on how we can tackle this together as a collective. Uh, moving to some politics now, Deputy President